Welcome to a real Python code conversation. In this guided walkthrough, you will learn about scopes and closures in Python using a practical example and stepping through it using a debugger. Maybe you've been wondering how do closures and scopes work in Python and like one of our participants during the office hours, you just heard about object.dunder closure and you're just wondering what is going on here. And there is a nice answer on Stack Overflow by Martin Peters that goes into depth about what is included in object under closure, but it's kind of still hard to read. And there's a piece of code in there that is maybe not that easy to understand if you don't have the context and if you don't have a lot of experience with scopes and closures. So what I'm going to do today in this video is I'm going to take this code, pick it apart and walk you through it step by step. And in the process of doing this, you're going to learn about scopes and closures in Python. And hopefully it's going to help you to get a better sense of what's actually going on in here. Also keep in mind that we have articles on this topic. We have one called Namespaces and Scope in Python and another one about Python scope and the LEGB rule, resolving names in your code. So check those out as well if you still have questions or if you're curious to read more in depth about this topic. So to get started, I'm going to just take this piece of code and copy it and then head over to my editor. And for this walkthrough, I'm going to use Thony. This is a beginner editor that gives you a really nice way of stepping through a debugging session. And this is why I'm going to use it for this video. So I'm just pasting this code in here. But to be honest, it's a bit hard to understand what's going on here if you have such non-descriptive names. So I will change those a little just to make it easier to keep track of what's going on later when I'll walk you through this code. So foo, this is going to be an outer function. So I'll just call it outer. And we'll have to change this in the function call as well. Then you have bar here, which is going to be the inner function. So I'll call it inner in all the occurrences. And then spam, this is really just a message that you want to print out. So I'm going to rename that to message. And let's keep a classic hello world as the message that you're printing. And finally, you're returning in the function. One more thing out here, what you're really returning is the inner function object. So I'm going to call it inner returned. And that about finishes up this quick refactoring that is really just renaming the different names of the functions and of the variables that are used in this piece of code. And it's going to make it easier for us to keep track of what's actually happening in this code when we step through it. And that's about it. So this is going to be a quick course that just goes about understanding the scopes and closures in Python. And in the next lesson, you'll get started stepping through this code example using the debugger in Donny. In this lesson, you'll use the Thony debugger to step through this piece of code that you quickly refactored in the previous lesson. And then you'll hopefully get a good idea of what's going on in terms of different scopes and closures in this example code snippet here. So to get started debugging, I'm going to click on the debug current script button in the top of the Thony menu bar. That's a little bug symbol. And when you click this, then it starts the debugger. And you can already see that it nicely highlights the first thing that is going to execute inside of the script when you run it, which is going to be the function definition of outer. What I'm going to be doing is using the step into button to just keep stepping through the code line by line. And I'll use the shortcut, which is F7 in this case. So you won't see me click the button up here, but just know every time that the yellow thing jumps somewhere else is when I'm stepping into the next line of code. So let's get started. First thing is the function definition. And then keep in mind that the function has been defined now, but that doesn't mean that what's inside of the function already exists. So these variables, for example, message here, or also the inner function, they haven't been defined yet. Because you just create the outer function at first, and only when you call the outer function, all of these variables in here are going to get defined. And this is going to happen in the next line of code on line 11. You're actually going to run the outer function. You're going to call it. So in this case, 
what happens is that Python needs to understand what does this auto refer to, and it figures out that auto refers to this function up here and opens up a new scope. This scope is the local scope of the outer function. So I can see in here how Thony's debugger nicely shows what's going on here visually. You can see that it even opens up a new window that represents the new scope that you're working with in here. And if you have some understanding of scopes, then you know that this scope has access to the global variables. But for example, any variable that you define in here is not going to be accessible in the global scope. And this local scope during the function execution now actually starts to define also the inner function. And it's going to define the message variable next when we keep stepping through the code. So function inner gets defined and you can see it show up here as a local variable. There is now a local variable called inner that points to a function object that is defined inside of the local scope of the outer function. And now next you're going to define a variable message and first Python needs to understand what is this hello and it figures out it's a string and then assigns that string to the variable message. And you can see that one pop up in your local variables here as well. Now you have the two defined variables. You have inner, which is a function object, and message, which points to the string hello. All right, now you keep going. And the next line of code is going to be a call to the inner function. So Python understands what's going on. And because this is a new function call, it opens up yet another scope for the inner function. So this is a new local scope that relates to the inner function. And in here, there's not much going on. You have a call to the print function that is going to print out a message. But what is this message, right? Because you have access to the higher up scope, in this case, it's called the non-local scope to the inner function because it's you're talking about a nested function that lives inside of another function. So this nested function has access to the variables that were defined in the function that contains the inner function. So in our case, this is the outer function. And it also has access to the variables that were defined in the non-local scope, in the local scope of the outer function, which is the non-local scope to this inner function. So this is why you can see that the inner function comes with a local scope that says message hello. So the correct term is to call this variable a non-local variable because it isn't defined inside of the local scope of the inner function, but in the higher up scope of the outer function. Now, if I keep stepping, you're going to see that Python understands that this is a call to the print function. It evaluates the variable message in here, understands it points to the string hello, and then knows what to do with it, which is printed to the console. So you can see it come up out here in your script in the output. You can see hello printed to the console. And this none that you can see there is just the return value of the print function, which is none. The next step is going to be closing the scope because the function execution is over and it returns something. And because you don't have an explicit return value in the function definition of inner, Python returns the default of none. So this is also what Thony is showing you here. And this ends the local scope of this specific call to the inner function. Every function call opens up its own scope, even if you call the same function object multiple times. So if you keep going, now you'll see that you're back inside of the scope of the outer function. And here, the message variable is going to be redefined to something else. It's going to point now to the string world. And you can also see that change down here in the local variables. And you're back to another call to the inner function. Now, this is going to go down pretty similarly to what happened just before. So let's step through it. We have another call to the same function object, but because it's a new call, it opens up a new scope. And this new scope, again, through the non-local variables, has access to world. So this message is a non-local variable. And again, Python will be able to print it. And now it's not hello anymore, but it's world. And you can see it come up here in the console as well. You have another return value of none for the print function call and then another return value of none for the call to the inner function. All right, and then your outer function is about to return. And this function doesn't return none, but instead it returns the function object inner. It figures out what that is. That is a function object in the local scope of the outer function <laughs> called inner, and that gets returned. You can see it here's the return value of that function call that you started with, and it gets assigned to inner returned and now it lives inside of here. And finally, for the last line of code, 
line 12, you're going to call in a returned. And now it's a little interesting what's going to happen there. And I'm going to stop this lesson and give you a chance to try it out yourself and see whether what happens is what you expect to happen. Once you're done, move to the next video and you're going to see what happens when we step through this final call to inner return. In the previous lesson, you stepped through most of this code that we have here on the page, but you stopped shortly before calling inner return. So now this is going to be the final call to the inner function object that you returned from the outer function call. And what happens is, again, you will open up a new local scope, just like you did during the other two calls to inner. And now you still have access to the message variable, as you can see here, through the non-local scope of the inner function. And this might be surprising that this is going to print a world a second time, because you might wonder, okay, so the call to the outer function is over. So that scope is closed. You don't see the window here anywhere anymore, right? Like the scope is gone. But because inner was defined inside of the outer function, it also has access to the variables that were defined inside of the outer function through the so-called non-local scope. And because the last value that message got inside of this function definition was world, it still points to that same string. So now if you continue execution, you will see pattern evaluates the print call, evaluates message to world, and then it's ready to print it out and it shows up on your console. Again, the print function returns none and also in a return because it's still that function object up here that you're working with also returns none. And that finishes the execution of your script. So now your output is one time hello from the first call to the inner function, one time world from the second call to the inner function, which both still happen inside of the outer function. And then the third time, the third call to the inner function, which I called here inner return because it's the return function object, prints out again the string world because this was the last value that message got inside of the definition of the outer function and inside of the body of the outer function. And the inner function keeps a knowledge of what that variable is through the non-local scope of that function. This was a lot to step through and I hope it made it a little easier by just giving those functions and variables easier to understand names and also by using Thony and seeing the different scopes pop up as separate windows. That's about it for this code snippet. But in the next lesson, we're going to dig a little deeper and figure out where does this variable get stored in Python? Like how come does this inner function object still has access to this non-local variable? And where does it live? And you'll jump a little into an interpreter session and play around with it to figure out how Python handles this internally. In this lesson, you'll dive a little behind the scenes of what happened here and see where Python stores the different variables that you've been working with and how it keeps track of the non-local scope of a function even after the scope of the function was already dereferenced. And for this, I'm going to use an IPython interpreter session instead of continuing with Thony here. You could also continue down here in the debugger. So you still have access to anything that you wrote in here, and you could work with it in the interpreter session as well. But I'm just going to move over to an IPython session in my terminal because it gives me a little more space and also a somewhat better autocomplete and syntax highlighting. So if I paste the exact same code into the IPython interpreter session here and press enter, you again see the output that you got and you remember how it got to be by stepping through it before. And now we're going to inspect a little more this inner returned object as well as the outer function object. Before you will go on this dive with me down below the surface of Python, here's a chance to take a quick look at a couple of the vocabulary that I'll be using. Now, don't get overwhelmed when this feels like a lot. We'll recap it later on again, and some of it might make sense while you hear me walk through it, and some of it might not make sense, and that's okay as well. I would suggest to just go with it for now, then check whether you understood it when we're going in the recap, and otherwise just rewatch it a second time, check out the docs, there will be some links around, and just approach it with a relaxed mindset. You don't need to understand everything to get the point of something. So with that said, here's some of the vocabulary that you will hear 
you will hear about a Thunder code object and you will hear about two attributes on this Thunder code object. First, .co cell vars and then also .co free vars. And then you will hear about another object on the function object, which is .thunder closure. Further, you'll hear about a cell object and an attribute on a cell object that's called dot cell underscore contents. Now you can pause these screens and read what they do or go to the documentation if you prefer to do this before the walkthrough. But my suggestion is to just dive in, hold your breath, or better, don't hold your breath because I think it's going to be a bit too long for that. But you'll come out on the other side being just a little bit wiser. So first of all, I'd be curious to see where did this message variable get stored. And there's two parts to this. So first of all, when you defined the outer function, then it created a code object that has a couple of arguments to it. And the one that's relevant for us at the moment is the co cell vars. Because this is where an outer function stores the variables that get defined in there that might be accessed by an inner function. So this is where the outer function stored message. And there could be more of those. This is a tuple. And if there were other variables defined in here, you would see them come up here in the tuple. But in this example, we only have this one message variable. But this is where it gets defined in the outer function. And then you also have the inverse thing for the inner function. So let's check out the inner returned function object. And it has this Thunder closure, which let's look at it first before going deeper. You see, this is another tuple, and it holds, in this case, just one value, and that is a cell value. Yeah. Again, there's one value in here because we only have one variable defined. But if there were more, then you would just see this tuple continued with additional cell objects in there. Let's look at how you can get the value of this. If you look at this first cell object, which is going to hold the reference that connects the message variable with a value, and you can find it by going... So first of all, you have to access this first item in the tuple, which is this cell object. And then you see in the autocomplete already, it has the argument called cell contents, and this is what holds the actual value. So this is where message relates to the string world. This is where it got defined and where it's stored inside of the thunder closure of the inner returned function object. Now, the inverse to like the reference to the variable name also sits somewhere, and that sits inside of something called under code, just like the one that you looked at up here for the outer function. The outer function has co cell bars to hold this reference, and the inner one, so co cell bars is empty, but instead the co free bars holds this reference here. So the name of the variable that is accessible in the inner scope of the inner function. And this is how this connection gets made. So when you define the outer function, then it puts any variables that are in there into this code co cell vars and gives the name of them in here. And these are variables that might be accessible in the scope of an inner function. And then the inner function that you define inside of an outer function also has this standard code object and has co free vars, which makes the connection back to this are variables that are defined in a non local scope from the perspective of this function. But they are still accessible. And then if you're actually looking for the content, like what does this binding point to, which value, then you have to go into Thunder Closure. So again, let's look at this Thunder Closure again, print it out. Thunder Closure is a cell object. You are looking at the first, and in this case, only cell object in here which is the message variable that you saw connected up here, right? And this points to the value that is stored in cell contents, which is world in that case. And this is why you can go ahead and keep calling in a returned and you keep getting back this value world here, which is because the function definition looks like that, that you were just printing out this message. And you can keep doing that. 
one can keep saying in a return and it'll always I call it it'll always return the world until I do something which you probably shouldn't do because anytime that you're dealing with this thunder objects in Python this is usually something that's for internal use of Python and that's not really something as an end user you're meant to be messing with but you can Python gives you often this opportunities too so you can do something fun like going into in a returned closure cell contents and instead of just printing it you're going to now assign it to a new value you're going to say oops and that changed the value of this variable that you before defined in the non-local scope of the inner function so in the local scope of the outer function by the variable name message but now you just stepped in there you went into the function object into its thunder closure into the cell object that is stored in there which is this reference between the variable name and its value and then you change the value of this variable name so the variable name is still message but now if you go ahead and say in a returned you get out oops instead of world which you had before but the function signature is still the same so if you look at let's see if that works in a returned you can see that here you have the thunder code object. You can so keep stepping in there in a return thunder code. See so what you get here. And then you have the co free vars. That's what you're looking for in that case. Co free vars. And this is still going to point to message. All right, well, we don't want to get the dir here. So let me just print out the actual value of this. You can see that it's still this tuple with a variable of the name message. But now the value of the mapping of this message variable, you changed it to point to oops instead of world, which is what it was when you defined it inside of the outer function. So this exploration into the Dunder objects on your function objects in Python gives you a bit of a look under the hood of what's going on when you're defining scopes and closures and where Python makes the connections and stores variables as well as the values of the variables. I'll start the recap with going again over the theoretical part of the deep dive glossary. Now you might understand a little better what the different objects do because you have a bit of practical experience with them. And then we'll do another recap going over the different examples practically in the interpreter again. Let's get started with the first object and its description. The first one you got to know was the Dunder code object, which is present on all function objects and it contains compiled function bytecode. Now this is pseudo compiled code that just contains the information of what does this function do so that you can execute it later on. This gets defined for every function object and gets executed when you call the function. You can also execute the Dunder code object of a function explicitly. Then you got to know two attributes on the Dunder code object. The first one being co cell vars, which is a tuple that has names of the different cell variables that can be referenced by a containing scope. So this is from the perspective of the outer function, and it'll contain variable names that inner functions could access from that specific function scope. And then somewhat related, you have .co free vars which is a tuple of names of free variables, which means that this is from the perspective of an inner function. What are the variables in a non-local scope that are accessible in this inner function? Then you also got to know the Dunder closure object, which also exists for each function object, but which will be none if the function does not contain another scope. And if it does, then it will be a tuple of cells that contains the bindings of the function's free variables, which means the connections between the free variables that this function can access in the non-local scope and the pointers to their values. Then you saw a cell object, which represents this bindings for variables that can be referenced from different scopes. And you also saw an attribute on the cell object which is cell underscore contents. And that can be used to get the value of the cell and also to set it, which you both got to see in the walkthrough. 
Now, after this theoretical recap, let's hop back into the interpreter and quickly walk over the different experiments again. The outer function keeps the references to any variables that are defined within its local scope in an object that is called Thunder Code and then a co Selvars argument, which is a tuple that keeps track of the variables that are defined within the local scope of this function and that might be accessible to an inner function. And an inner function does something similar. And inside of its Thunder Code object on a different attribute, you get the variables that were defined in a non-local scope from the perspective of the inner function. So in this case, the message variable was defined in the outer function. And this reference is stored inside of Thunder Code co freevars And an inner function has a different Thunder object called double underscore closure that contains cell objects, which represent the mappings between these variables the variable names and the actual values. And the values are then stored inside of this cell object. So in this case, I'm going to have to step into the first one because we only have one defined in this outer function. And I don't want to reassign it, but actually just print it out. Each cell object has an argument called cell contents. And this is where the actual value is stored. And then I also showed you that you can do funny things like reassign this to a different string or to anything different, really. <laughs> So I could assign it also to a number, right? So this is just a value. And that this also reflects then to the output of that function object. So this is really where the value lives that was defined in a non-local scope and how it's possible in Python that you still have access to this value even after the scope that initially defined it has been dereferenced and, and doesn't really exist anymore. So I hope that this walkthrough through the code example from the Stack Overflow answer by Martin Peters that talks about closures and scopes in Python and what is actually stored inside of Thunder Closure was helpful to better understand this answer and try to give it another go now. In my opinion, the variable names used in here and function names aren't ideal and make it a bit harder to understand, but maybe with this refactoring and then stepping through it with the interpreter, you get a better understanding of what's happening there. And I wanted to show you this also as an example of how you can approach understanding an answer or a question that might at first sight look a little difficult. You can always refactor, you can always use a debugger to step through it, and that usually helps to get a better understanding of what's happening. And now, if you feel up for it, there is a second part to this answer. So we've kind of gone up to here and talked about that. And then there's a second part to this answer. Go ahead and read over that, try to refactor it, and try to do this yourself and see if you can understand what's happening here and why. I hope this walkthrough has been helpful for you. Keep in mind that there's links also in here that point to the Python talks about the data model where you can learn more about Dunder Closure and Dunder Code, and that we also have two relevant tutorials in real Python, one about namespaces and scope in Python, and another one about the LEGB rule specifically. So make sure that you check out these tutorials as well if you're interested in this topic and if you want to learn more. Stay curious and keep digging and don't get discouraged when sometimes you see a piece of code that's a little hard to take apart and understand. Just take your time and use your interpreter, use your debuggers, and you can learn a lot on the way. <laughs>